get canceled before we even start. Get I mean, we have to start. Yeah, I mean, we've started. We're on episode thirteen, and we're we still haven't started yet. <laughs> and canceled. And you're done. What it do? Welcome back to another episode of and the party games experience. Today is going to be a light cast, but we might be more productive, only two of us here. Uh, we have on the microphone always the consistent, the ever-so-vigilant... De Hoffren. And the guy who follows him uh, around, clean up his mess, Chaz. So, it's funny, I, I, I want to say something before we start talking about what tickled our fancy. So today, I feel like we are officially, our channel has officially reached a level of professionalism. I was today reached out to by a bot or uh, um, uh, a person, we'll call it a person, on Reddit that said, hey, I've noticed your channel doesn't have these SEOs, and I'm a professional marketer. If you want to, I can start working with you about getting your channel up and like out there and get you guys viewers and subscribers and such. And I was like, oh, well, how would you do that? And they're like, oh, I would just go ahead and I would do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, well, that's great. Thank you for sending that to me. And I'm done. <laughs> so we have officially reached the level of a target. Sweet. We've been targeted by a bot or by a person with like five followers. <laughs> I.e. someone with less people than us. So. With that being said, and that that our that's our level of professionalism and our level of what's the word I'm looking for here? Well, how professional we are. Let's talk about what tickles your fancy today, Dauphin. What's tickling my fancy? It's a little bit old, and by little bit, it's more recent than other stuff that I've talked about. Uh, I found the future state. Uh, series of DC Comics, and specifically I jumped in because I found out that they were sending Superman to a war planet, sort of like Hulk did when the Planet of the Hulk, where he just has to go to a a planet of fighting gladiators and fight his way out. And, and it started with Superman War of Worlds, issue number one. And I got it, because as you can see, I was very interested in a Superman in just his underwear and chains hey fighting like a gladiator. Reading up on it, I was told that you have to start with uh, – where did he go? Oh, no, I lost him. Uh, Future State Superman of Metropolis, which picks up with his son taking on the mantle of Superman. So I had to start with that one. Read it. Not a bad story. Uh, he has been fighting and dismantl dismantling a uh, global tycoon that was set in Metropolis. That's not Lex Luthor, but very similar to Lex Luthor because he takes uh, Brainiac technology, steals it, and uses it to mind control all of the people of Metropolis. And super, the new Superman uh, defeats him, finds out that the new Brainiac uh, is now controlling uh, things and trying to take over Metropolis. So he decides his only course of action to save Metropolis is to shrink it and put it in a bottle. Like the city which, of Candor? Like the city. And... Uh, of course, Supergirl finds out, and she's not too happy. And so that's that story. In it, they only lightly mention that Superman left the planet and put his son in charge. So that was a little bit of a letdown of, I thought it was the prequel to the War of Worlds. I read the War of Worlds. It's three different stories in one comic. And the Superman comic story part is pretty much nothing it's just great art beautiful art but no substance to that that story and in the two of them there's 
pretty much nothing about him fighting and being on the planet. And then at the end of the second one, it says continued in future state house of L. So I go out and, of course, buy House of L, which is a one-shot. And in this one, uh, they're defending the their version of the United Federation of Planets is the United Federation of Supermen and their planets. And there's this big, huge onslaught of world-destroying people coming to take them out and their fight to destroy it. And... In the end of War of Worlds 2, it doesn't really talk about him defeating, conquering, and escaping like it alludes to that he was going to do. It's just months later we get this. So these stories, while they were good, no substance, no real flow. I'm still left with questions. Uh, if there's anybody out there watching that actually read these as well, and understand something that I missed. Maybe there's other because they did future states of Batman, future states, Superman and Wonder Woman, future state of Wonder The whole plethora of DC was thrown into a future state. And there were certain causes that caused the future state. There was, they, I'll pull one out real quick. At the beginning of each comic, it does state uh, uh, the triumphant victory of the hero saves all of reality from the brink of destruction and shakes loose a very the very fabric of space and time. From the ashes of death metal rises the life, the new life of the infinite multiverse and a glimpse into the possible unwritten worlds of tomorrow. And that's all the future states. So Something I might have missed in Death of Metal, something I might have missed in some of the other future states, but these three pieces alone that when I dug into the internet and read about what I needed to do for World of Wars leaves me with a bunch of holes and is kind of underwhelming. So now, what what are some big things that happened to Superman? Because like one of the one of my one of the interesting comics variations that uh i liked a lot the superman they the they they went on was back in 2003 when they did a three shot series superman uh red sun where superman uh kal-el landed in russia russia america and how the ideology is still similar in the sense of country uh duty honor things like that but under a different regime what does that what does that fall under with the the country love the country duty honor things like that because America feels has different ideologies than Russia does especially when you're talking about early two thousands like like I said two thousand three has Superman have to come over overcome anything like that with with this new uh, World of Wars is that what it's called uh War World yeah of that's War. what it's called World of War and no. So in this one, it's still Superman, and like I said, he – I thought he was abducted and sent there, or – yeah, sent there. And from what it, what I've read in the comics, it sounds like he knew he was leaving and he was going there, and he had a plan to go there. And so he left his son in charge as the new Superman. So it's still just the regular Superman from America that went off and left Metropolis. And they kind of talk about that in in the man of metropolis things about uh him leaving us and is is he really gone they they talk about all the despair that has happened since he left and if he was really still alive would he not come back to us when we really need him and everybody is upset and confused about what uh uh his son did and they're they're afraid of not afraid a little bit afraid a little bit concerned is he able to do what superman could do because as far as everybody else is aware metropolis is gone and missing and it's because of his son well 
it's it's interesting because I love that I love how this segues into like the conversations of like Superman versus I want to say they put him up against the character uh, Goku from Dragon Ball Z, and one of my one of the most famous uh, conversations now between like anime and comic book fans, uh, even fans that are are both. Um, I think anime a lot of people go with with a lot of the older anime people kind of go with Goku versus Superman, and now it's One Punch Man versus Superman. How they always go back to Superman, they always go back to the going back to Superman being the strongest DC character, me one one of the strongest DC characters. But it's funny, I was reading like when we were talking about who would win in a fight between Goku, One Punch Man, or Superman, these kind of characters. Where Superman, the dichotomy of Superman is that he can't lose. He has to lose first. And then the way he's written, he has to come back. So the same thing with Goku, same thing with, except for One Punch Man, he can't lose, it looks like. But like Goku, they have to lose first. Like no matter what the battle is, they both have to lose. And then both of them have to become strong enough to overcome whatever obstacle is set in front of them. I find that very interesting about Superman. As I've gotten older, I started looking more and more into it. It's funny, I actually was wearing my Superman shirt most days. Now I'm wearing my X-Men shirt. You can kind of see X-Men there. Um, I'm wearing my X-Men shirt. But I'm a huge Superman fan. Uh, my, my wall of Superman's got moved over to here and stuff like that. But it's, it was interesting to kind of see that the character is has to lose and then is written to become, you know, how do you say, he has to overcome the obstacle. He has to overcome the situation. Do you know why they both have to lose and overcome their situations? They both have a similar quality. What's that? They will not kill. They will not Go be pushed will. When he's finally pushed, and that is, he's got to lose first. He's not just going to go sit out and, oh, you're the bad guy. I'm going to kill you. It's, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to try everything in my power to keep you from doing what you're going to do. But if I have to choose between killing you or letting you destroy the world, the city, the whatever, sure. it is and same with Superman. He will do everything in his power not to kill. And that is the first thing that you put these two people up against each other. They're not really going at each other at full force because if they did, it would be death blows. Now, we know Superman, his laser beam is strong enough to penetrate uh, Doomsday's skull and basically give him a lo lobotomy. And he can kill uh, the Doom Doomsdays that way. So how strong or how thick is Goku's skin? Because that's the first main factor is all Superman has to do is laser beam and focus right at Goku's forehead and just well, you're, fry his you're brain. Discussing, I think what you're discussing, what I'm discussing is two different things. I think you're discussing them as the, the real version of them, which I'm not knocking whatsoever. And I'm, I'm more of looking at from the, the uh, author part of it, the – the me, the reader, reading the character versus if the actual characters fought. I thought it was funny how when you look at when you look at the the breakdown of Superman that it's it's uh, foregoing the reasons why he's like that. I thought it was funny that he has to lose and for him to come back and he's written no matter what. It's like that old schoolyard phrase like infinity. Okay, well fifty plus one. You're like because. <laughs> It's that it's that plus one, you know. Uh, I probably could insert the clip of uh, from the movie Waiting, uh, extraordinary. Just that little extra, <laughs> the difference between yeah. extraordinary and extra. Um, it, it's it's very interesting. It's very interesting for me when I look at Superman for that. That that's that's why I think it's so great about Superman, the way they wrote him. It's like my favorite Marvel character is Cyclops. And everybody hates Cyclops. He's a dude everybody bag. hates him. Everybody except for me. He's I got my little shelf total here. Total douchebag of all the Cyclops stuff. But it, the uh, people who are really into comic books will say with a little asterisk that's just the way he's written. He's 
his character is really not a d bag. Just they they write him in d bag scenarios. He always has to be the d bag of making a hard decision this and that. Whereas Wolverine gets to be the cool loner. You know, not the whole team can be cool loners. You know. So, I find it interesting, like, to see that, like, and I, I think it's very cool how they, they interpose Superman out of the ordinary, like, I'm going to punch the bad guy, bam. It's like, go to another world. What happens to Earth when Superman's gone? Like, how does Earth continue? Not will it continue, but how? You know? The Justice League. Okay, but again, the Justice League, it, it, it's 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 a widely known fact that Darkseid did not view Earth as an opportunity for conquering because of the Asgardian, or not not the Asgardian. I apologize. I'm thinking of Marvel. <laughs> the um, oh goodness gracious, I just lost the name for it. The word what's what the uh, the Kryptonian. His uh, always words were, "Well, the Kryptonian's there, so I'm not going to even. I'm not. Gonna, it's not worth it. The losses are too much. I'm not going to do it. But once the Kryptonian's gone, it sets up for that. So now that Superman's gone off in the world, uh, war worlds, uh, worlds of war, what is Earth? What's happening? Can the Justice League fight? Because in the horrible movie, or apparently the Zack Snyder four hour cut, the Justice League can't do it without Superman." And that was that was a horrible interpretation that a lot of people got. When I watched – I didn't watch the movie when it first came out, and then one of my friends had that big complaint. He's like, oh, my god. It was horrible. The whole Justice League, the whole time they're talking is they want Superman. How do we get Superman back? We can't do this. They mathematically, theoretically, thoughtfully, however you want to put it, set it out and realized they would not survive without Superman. And that was the only thing. They they could have very well defeated it by themselves. And you can see in a couple of the fighting scenes that it really wasn't Superman that really weighed the fight one way or the other. It's just that there would have been more casualties within the Justice League without Superman. And that is what he turned the tides with, was how many of, how whether it be Flash, probably Batman, because it was going to be Batman, <laughs> Aquaman or Woman Woman, which one of these characters would have died if Superman wasn't put in the picture? But if you watch it, you can see that without Superman, they still would have won, but they probably all would have lost Batman. Well, again, I I, I I get what you're saying. I think that's uh, those are those are definitely. I'm not I'm not saying those points are wrong at all. I'm more fascinated with how the authors are revitalizing a storyline that you would think after 60, 70, 80 years uh, that are re still keeping it current, still keeping it in minds. Because you think after 80 years of Superman being around that, okay, enough's enough. We get it. He's strong. He's super strong. Like, I think one of my favorite Superman moments is in the an Batman animated series where Batman was taken over by Brainiac and Superman went to Gotham City dressed as Batman. Yeah. And I love the subtlety of, like, people, like, when, Bat when, when Superman would walk away because Robin had to kind of tell him, you know, you're, you're supposed to leave now. Like, go go ahead and go. <laughs> and Mr. Man's like, oh, yeah. And he walks off and everyone's like, has he gotten bigger? <laughs> that was close. You're telling me. The sooner we find your boss, the better. Right side. Does he look bigger to you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and then... When he fights Bane, and Bane gets drop on him and does all the stuff to him, and it doesn't hurt him, but he he's able to like you know knock him around and stuff. I think it's funny to watch Superman get caught Try up to... his guard, and I like the like when the authors take that that the liberty of like throwing him around, getting him beat up a little bit, and then of course he comes back with like I'm 
I'm fucking Superman. I'm going to rip out of your manacles and I'm going to beat the piss out of you. <laughs> well, and there's a lot about Superman that people don't remember or a lot of people read because there is a plethora of multiverses. There's a plethora of stories. But we forget that there is a uh, Justice League Dark, I think it's called, where it's the, all the magic users. You've got uh, Constantine, uh, the demon, or our... Uh, are part of that Justice League that deal with magic and the dark arts. And in one of them, uh, Superman was there, and he started off in the beginning of the comic. He walks up to this this house, this mansion, and he knows, he whether it's that she talked to him telepathically, I forget, but he's got this sense, and he's aware that there is this powerful, magical being inside this place. And he literally turns around and says, nope. I'm out, peace you. This I can't touch. And it was the Enchantress. And he he had to leave it up to somebody else because this was something that Superman was not fit or built to deal with. And he has his limitations, and he, he knows when to quit, but he also knew that there were other people who could take care of it. Had there not been somebody there, he would have fought and probably died again and still won but in doing so sacrificed his own life but because there's other cannon fodder to throw he's like no well i mean yeah he he, he sees a battle he can't win because superman is is uh, susceptible to magic i mean his weakness is magic uh which i like the fact that everyone has a weakness that that that's these make these characters like more interesting when I mean, you can't have a character that's impervious to every single thing there is. I like that, you know, hey, magic, that's what does it. And I like how they interject magic into the into the universe with that. But it's funny. Every time I talk about Superman, every time I think about Superman, I love Marvel's answer to, Su- answer to Superman. Like, do you know a character that you think is the opposite, like the, the Marvel's version of Superman? Normally, I would say Captain America, but I think you're going to tell me I'm wrong. Captain America versus Superman. I mean, Captain America, I mean, Superman just rip him in half. I mean, like strength, physicality, all that stuff. I want to say I have the comic books. I've read them. I need to go pull them back out. Do I have one hanging up? There was a character called Gladiator. He is the most outlandish character but he's the best summed up as a superman equal he you see him in the animated version of x-men when the shiar come down with uh they they have to uh, i, I want to call it dilithium chris i know it's not dilithium but that's that's what fuels the starship enterprise i know but <laughs> um the shiar come down and this is the, the birth of the phoenix saga right and yeah. the shiar's Head of head of like the army, the general of the army is a character named Gladiator, and he's wearing like this weird per- red and black spandex with a purple mohawk, and um, Juggernaut punches him, and he doesn't even he doesn't even move. He just kind of doesn't he, doesn't even register the hit, and then throws Juggernaut across the bay, and it was become famous for "I'm the Juggernaut, bitch" a video that came out years ago, but. Why are we listening to Mr. Bad Hair Day? Why don't you just flip back where you... Uh-huh. I like when I like when they when they do that Marvel coming over to Marvel and DC kind of go back and forth with each other. And I like when they create a character that's Moon Knight would be Batman in Marvel and Gladiator is Superman in Marvel. And then you have other characters in DC that kind of go back and forth between the two. But it's very interesting to me to, again, see like all these arcs. And I like it. So I was wrong. I thought I was going to about ready to say because I thought it was Captain America. He fought in the – they did that crossover. Marvel versus DC. Well, Captain America would fight Batman, not not Superman. 
uh, it was uh, Batman or Superman fought uh, Hulk. The Hulk. Yeah, I got the comic book right and, there. It's on my wall. Yeah. That that's what I was looking for right now too. It was mine. And oh, I remember, you have a copy no, of that I. Too? Yeah. Oh, it's not a comic you see every day. So. You yeah. see it on my and wall think... when you come over, and you never said I I had that one. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I I just I didn't know. <laughs> Uh, That's why we I never think it assume, was, right? <laughs> right. I think it was Batman and Wolverine, wasn't it? Probably. I don't know how Batman can survive against Wolverine. Yeah. Because Wolverine's fought the Hulk. And Batman Wolverine's fought Hulk, everybody. I don't, I don't see a contest. Yeah. Again, it's like ripping Batman in half because all those toys just bounce off of him. But I, we'll have to re- read that and talk about that. On another podcast. Another was the... podcast. Well, I mean, it's a pretty simple one. I mean, it's we're both on the same side. As Superman would just rip that person in half, or Hulk would just rip <laughs> that person in half. I mean, it's like when the Juggernaut ripped Deadpool in half. It was just perfect. It was like you could not have done that any better. <laughs> just I'm gonna rip you in half now. It's like okay, I guess you have to. Well, let's talk about what tickled my fancy. And I thought about this, so people know, like, kind of how how we come up with the podcast ideas. We we kind of talk a week before we do it, and we kind of we, we start formulating ideas of what would be fun to talk about and kind of things in our life and stuff. And one that got me was how is technology killing gaming? And because I was I was the context behind it, I was listening to a TJ normally here with us. Normally, something wrong with your connection, Chad. It's mine. I think it's yours because you're you keep okay. cutting in and out. You keep cutting it out of my. Oh, so, uh, it might be both of ours. So we apologize for our technical difficulties and shortcomings. Yeah, we're still not that professional. So, um, basically, I'll go back to what I was saying. Was um, we're talking? I'm talking about how gaming is how technology is killing gaming. How I came up with that was I was listening to my friend, our friend TJ, talk about. How he was playing, he went from playing the Call of Duty game, uh, Call of Duty whatever, 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 the newest one. He went back to Apex Legends, and in Apex Legends he was getting his butt whooped because he didn't have an auto-aimer and an aiming bot. And it made me start thinking, like, why is that, why do you guys use that? Like, shouldn't you be, like, solely winning off of the merit of your ability, not what a game could do for you, not what a program can do for you, macros and stuff like that. And that got me thinking about tabletop. So when you look at 5th edition D&D, and 5th edition D&D, one of the modules, uh, one of our co- uh, co-hosts, Thor, brought it up to my attention, uh, brought this up to my attention, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. When you look at 5th edition modules, when they look at the flavor text of a module, like when you walk into a room, it's very blasé. It's kind of like the room smells of rust and salt, and you hear the drippings f- from the overhead stalagmites, or stalactites, whichever one's on top, dripping down onto the, into a puddle. You're like, okay, cool. Versus like second edition, like the creaking of the, of the wood reminds you of the old chair your grandmother had and the musk from the Oda High's dead body uh, is reluct- it brings you back to a time of, you know, it's very much more in detail, very much more tells you the story in that flavor text versus the there's water dropping from the ceiling. And I think technology is doing that, killing our imagination to where now it's like, unless I see it, I don't care. I don't want to hear it. What do you think, Chuck? Or Uh, uh, I've got many theories about this topic. That scenario specifically, I think technology has uh, given everybody so many options that the reason it ruined it in that scenario is that it made the the writers, I wouldn't call it lazy, but less concerned about flavor text because with even before technology uh most 
not most DMs, not calling out people who don't, but get so involved with uh, the flavor and the surrounding that they'll sit there and they'll do mood lighting. They'll make a, uh, back in the day when we had to do mixtapes, have a place set of sounds. So when you're with your group, you will go in there and you play this track for when they first walk in and you would literally, it says the sound of the dripping from the ceiling to the floor. They go out and they get that sound clip. So you walk in there and say, all right, you enter the cavern and then they play it and you hear the dripping and they immerse you in it. And so the writers got used to, all right, that's what people are already doing. Now with technology and the internet, they're going to find the picture. They're going to download the ambiance. We don't have to give it to them. And I think technology has ruined it in that way of them thinking, oh, they're already going to do this, so we don't have to embellish because they've got their own setting in mind of how they're going to put this there. Yeah, it's like... When I as a DM before, I remember like going trying to reach the technology stage, reach that technology stage, and with like Roll Twenty is doing right now and D and D Beyond. I, I remember like throughout the two thousands and the late nineties, like thinking, oh man, you know, digital, 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 and then even having like the the, the digital uh, TV underneath that was the map. You know, yeah, it was always something that I aspired to. And then when I got there, when I got to that point, it was lackluster. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I wasn't happy with it. I, I still, I'm not a big fan of Roll20. Not because of the, the system. I think it's great. I think it's good in like ways it, it, it can be. Like with people who, not, who like move away, you know, as adults, you know, people move away. You're not a fan of Roll20, not because of Roll20, but because Thor puts you to shame with his ambiance. Oh, he's well, got the. I mean, if we're talking about who's a better DM. <laughs> he's Thor got is definitely a better D DM than I am. He's got the moving map, so when we're on the boat, it's actually oh, rocking, yeah, and you see yeah. the rushes, and you hear this it rushing. He actually washing, gave one of our rushing. players seasickness. Absolutely, yeah, motion sickness. <laughs> we go into the cave, and he actually has the selectites. <laughs> dripping down and the, <laughs> that little <laughs> noise going he's he's the embodiment of that technology well, just so you using know, it. that's on my list of things to do my staycation my friend my co-host is how to interject that stuff because i found some music that's going to really help us out and like it's going to really you know i'm not going to spoil anything because you can't do that to me Please cut to Moss going to Jen and asking her, does this sound ominous enough to you? And then cut to him. <laughs> and then cut to him actually playing with the guys at the table trying to find the track. Oh, no, no, that's not it. No, 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 no that's not it. That's not it. Yeah, yeah. In interject those two clips right here. All right, at the 32 minute marker, I'll, do, I'll, I'll try to remember that. <laughs> but as a DM, I, I got there. And I was like, meh. And I thought to myself, like, if I had the TV screen underneath, how cool would that be? And then the more and more I thought about it, I'm like, well, I mean, it still does give me a 3D modeling of, like, Warhammer. If it's so good, why is Warhammer not using it? Why is Kings of War? Why are these miniature games not utilizing the, the, uh, a TV or projector of some sort? And it's, it's not because the technology's not there. It's there. They realize that it's not what it's cracked up to be. They still want the figurines. They still want the terrain. You know, I mean, you see my figurines up here. They still want it. And a two-dimensional, even three-dimensional on the screen, is still 2D flat screen. The monster on that flat screen, you're like, eh, eh. I want to see my miniature versus a min versus that miniature. I want to, I want to see that. And then technology's making us making us soft, like not making us read as much as we should. Yeah. It is making us soft. Uh, I, I've been rewatching uh, Star Trek Voyager. It is my favorite in the Star Trek uh, series. I do love the uh, next generation, but Voyager 7 of 9 is such a dynamic character in the fact of <laughs> she wants to be human and she wants to to understand why people are acting this way, but it is 
so stupid in her mind of why they're doing this because it's just pointless because she used to be a Borg. But that's another story for another time. Uh, we keep going into uh, the holodeck. And I looked to Mark last night, literally last night, and I said, wouldn't it be awesome if we could use the holodeck to play D&D? Oh, yeah, that's been, that's been said for... Forever. Forever, but yeah. But we've got... Uh, uh, PlayStation's got the Oculus. It's like, why can't we set up... Instead of figurines, you walk in with your Oculus and play set into a live, full, surrounded area and be your character. They tried that. They actually tried with augmented reality. They tried to do that with, with f cell phones and cards. Yeah. So what you would do is you would look at your through your camera phone at the at the map and then the monsters would appear. The problem was is most people their phones are being held together by duct tape and barely have enough memory for anything and Well, when they started that and that was great and then I was excited because after that we were promised Google Glasses. And then with Google Glasses you could totally augment and whether it be D and D or playing uh, Jurassic Park and seeing the giant Tyrannosaurus Rex in front of you, and so that it's placed in the real world and you're seeing the real world, so that you're not walking into traffic because you can't see the car because you can still see yeah, still what's see, around yeah. you. It was like that was the perfect thing to give me to let me do these things. And why aren't there enough nerds out there? Making this happen. Well, there is. Where are there. the Sheldons out there that love playing D and D that haven't made Google Glasses a thing yet? To where I'm walking around and fighting ogres in my backyard. Be because most of the people who play D and D can't physically do those things. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like uh, my. Then favorite. they become the spellcaster. Well, when you okay, I'm I'm, I'm sticking by what I said. <laughs> um, when you when you when you watch the movie Ready Player One, they just kind yeah. of really gloss over the fact that most of these people are running, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, wait, okay, you have this treadmill you run on, so you're running like up Mountain Doom or climbing. See, so that's your problem with read with watching the movie and not reading the book. Those running treadmills are too expensive, and most of the people who live in those little small houses, didn't afford that. It's sort of like when... Uh, but they moved to make their characters move that way. It was very... Right. You, did, you didn't have to run. It's sort of like... Uh, it, I want to say it was for PlayStation 2. No, it was Xbox. Xbox the had the, the Kinect. And there were games like I played a zombie attack movie and or game. And instead of having to walk or mimic walking, it was you take a step you lean forward and it moves your character forward. Yeah. So that's the way it was in the game. And running was you, you move your body in a certain way. Sure. And the game automatically moved it. So all these people who sit in their chair all day and didn't weren't active could still be as fast in that augmented reality and so red player to one. Technology? What? What happened to that technology? They gave up on it. And no, they, it died like a dodo bird. Cause it meant to die. It gave up on it. They needed to improve it and make it better. But that's the problem is you get to the point where technology doesn't improve anything. It's it's bringing it down. Like, I'm telling you, I've given up the idea of putting the TV in the table. I've given up on the idea of projecting anything. I bought the Warlock tiles because I want the physical piece. I want to play with toys on my table. That's what I want. Yeah, that's what we all want. That's what Cause as kids, because as kids we didn't weren't able to have all those things, or we did oh, and we miss right it. Now I've got expensive toys sitting out there. So as adults, we want to go back and play with the toys oh, no, but, like we but, did as kids. I've got kids out here. I got two kids of my own, and I've got them expensive gifts, expensive toys, but they want to play with my little figurines. Yeah, and they don't even move. They're articulated. They're just D and D figurine. But yeah, my my two my four year old boy is like, I want this. I'm like, you're this or, or this articulating dinosaur that mouth does this and talks and this and that. And he's like, I, I don't want that. I want your D and D one. 
I'm like, well, no, I, I painted that. That's that's what I painted. It doesn't move. It, I need him for a game. And he's like, well, I don't care. I want to fuck him up. You know? Like, ah! <laughs> that is why I'm glad I don't have little kids because my Tyrannosaurus Rex that I spent hours painting with you. Yep. See, mine's over here. I'm not going to get up and get him, but he is missing pieces. Like, the paint on his face is all, like, faded off and chipped away. Oh, yeah, no, you totally made a giant purple like, and pink and blue uh, T-Rex. Like, I would totally break a child's arm if they tried to touch it. <laughs> break a child's Yeah. So, like, we're all glad you don't have little children. Have kid, little children anymore. I fully understand <laughs> why I keep my toys away from kids and why I don't keep children's because i don't have the proper but the tech but going back to te technology <laughs> ruining gaming i think that go ahead the real thing for D D, why techno technology is ruining gaming it used to be the dm end all be all if i said as a dm this is how it's gonna be deal with it the players used to be all right DM rules. DM final rule. Now it is, oh, you told me I couldn't do that? Well, I've got five different web pages and Reddit threads that tell me that you're wrong and I should have been able to do it. Well, it doesn't work for my game. Uh, as a DM, I'm going to say, no. Five threads. How it tells me. You. How dare you tell me I can't do something because technology yeah. tells me that you're wrong. And that's it should always be DM's call. And now we have five people in the middle of a Wednesday night game looking on the internet for pictures of foyers to show the DM <laughs> to tell True the DM story. he's wrong. True story. Uh, they lost that battle because they lost the DM. But a bunch. It's, it's, I think the gaming is, gaming is suffering from technology because now technology is people have this this false sense of expectations from gamers uh from gaming de game developers uh, they, they're they pushing the envelope with with uh tech with um visual effects and audio effects that they're losing sight of what makes a game a game like a uh, storyline they sacrifice storyline and now even gamers are even game production companies are like going oh i know what i can do i can make it retro by making it eight bit but still shit storyline, still shit. It's like people are so immersed in the way things look and the way things are versus the way things should be by what story driven, what character is driven. I don't give a shit about this character who just died. I don't care. But whenever, like, I remember playing, like, for example, Shining Force 3. There was a character in the name Oberyn, and he was a, just a throwaway, just random person you got. But I, I liked playing him so much because he was one I connected with that if he died in a battle, I restarted the game. I restarted the battle. Like, nope, he will live. He needs experience points. And I think now it's hard to find that in games because technology, it's like the developers are like, we're going to have like two people author this, but we're going to have this team of hundreds focusing on the fact that the grass moves with the wind. And when you're they're like, hey, did you notice that the sweat, the beads of sweat off the person's brow is individually rendered and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, but why didn't, why didn't you have a low, a high? Why didn't you go through all these basics of storytelling? Uh, but did you see the sweat? The sweat had a reflection. I, I get that. Uh, Breath of the Wild. Beautiful game. Wonderful world. I spent hours in it too much too much time in it it had a decent story but i think that i loved it more for the graphics i you could see the wind and the grass rustling and it looked like real glass grass and just the art of that game and what i can do in it and i think that they sacrificed a little bit of the story because the story wasn't bad and I was able to follow it, and I liked the story. But I don't think it was in-depth as it could have been. But what I got in trade was 
an open world like you're talking about climbing the top of that mountain oh, Jesus just Christ. to see what's on top of there just make there's sure that so, one rock there are so many places in breath of the wild where you literally have to climb and find your way around and by damn it i will spend two days days on this game trying to find a way to climb up this mountain and i'll have to sit here and wait for the goddamn rain to stop because i keep slipping because oh, I will yeah, make it up that. there, and then fix that. Fix that. <laughs> there are there's climbing suits that work better in the rain. Nope, they still slip. I got it. I got the climbing gear. But, and but, there's fish and right. foods. <laughs> but when you look at when you look at Breath of the Wild, and I, I found the equation. I, I I know exactly what you're talking about. I watched this guy break it down, and it, it, I had this epiphany. When you look at Breath of the Wild, if, from a Zelda fan standpoint, who's played uh, a good chunk of the Zelda games, I didn't play a lot of Zelda games because I was in the Sega, not Nintendo. So I, I missed out like Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. I, I missed out Link of the Worlds. I have Link, a Link Between Worlds on my 3DS. I'm not a huge fan of it, right? Okay, whatever. I get why people like Zelda, right? It's a, good pl it's a great platformer, great puzzler. It's a great game. And all the games are great, to a point. But the reason why I think Breath of the Wild was so good, especially for Zelda fans, was like the difference between playing Warcraft 3. Because I played Warcraft 2, 1, 2, and 3. And I was a huge fan of all three of them. And played God knows how many hours on those three games, right? Still buy them, still have them on my computer to this day. But when I jumped into World of Warcraft, instead of seeing, an, instead of seeing the characters from top down, I was face to face with an abomination and I just I stopped in awe of seeing like how big this thing was and seeing the castles like seeing Azeroth for what Azeroth was now yeah. you're Zelda through the eyes of Zelda in the world because as you're going through like a link of link between worlds as you're going through all the little maps you're like eh, eh. now you're like oh my god this is what Zelda sees and having that open world like World of Warcraft, I think that's what did it. So that might be a case for technology help gaming. But again, let's look at games like let's look at board games. Technology is technology is ruining gaming because of there's board games out there, there's other games out there where they're getting early access and they're just not producing a game. They're like, here's early access. We're gonna you're gonna pay us to be our testers. And we're gonna we're we're just gonna give you shit. Yeah. Baldur's Gate three. Where the fuck are you? It, well, it's almost uh, a year. Uh. uh Kingdom Blue Hearts. Man. Kingdom Hearts. Uh, I don't know if it's more nostalgia than it is uh reality, but the first game that when it came out, I was invested in the story. I was there for it. I was. Uh, Sebastian in Neverending Story, where I felt everything Sora felt. Yeah! And I teared up at certain parts of it. And then I had to get Kingdom Hearts 3, and it was a good game. I enjoyed it. But it did not give me the feels that I got from the first story. And Kingdom Hearts 3, graphics and technology... Versus the first one, looking back at it, it's like, there's no comparison. But I really think Kingdom Hearts 1 was the Kingdom Hearts. But they, but when they progressed, they probably progressed the graphics too much. They probably went, like, they probably went down avenues of how we make it bigger, how we make reach more people. Don't right. worry about reaching people. A good storyline, people will come. Yes. It's like Breath and of the and Wild. Take Breath of the Wild, for example. The game's three years old. Still going for sixty dollars, still selling. You know how many copies a year? The DLC came out a couple of years after the game came out, and still one of the top items on the on the e store. Yeah. Again, quality will attract your people. Will attract them because, like with the freemium games, I was looking up statistics on on this right before we start doing it. It is ridiculous how much money is being made off of freemium games. It's millions of billions of dollars in freemium games. Developers now have to focus on cell phone games, freemium games, 
just to stay afloat. Because that's how much money's out there. Because people would just sit there and go, oh, 10 more coins, 10 more coins, 10 more coins, 10 more coins. You know, it's just yeah. $10, $10. They don't realize in one day they just clicked that little $10, bu- $10 button five times. That's 50 bucks. Yeah. I've been guilty of that. Yeah. I mean, Pokemon Go. I'm buying these coins. That I'm buying the $10 coins. And one day I was like, holy crap, I just spent $30 in one month on the coins for the remote raid passes. Crap. Could have bought a damn game. And you'll pay for the coins, but you won't pay for the uh, the special tickets to get Because every the special stores. ticket's been garbage. No. No. You so, did not get... No. What'd you get? Uh... <laughs> In the 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 one where you got to choose uh, red or green, sure, for seven ninety nine. Yeah, I got a shiny Ditto. Okay, whoop de doo. And I'm in the process of getting my shiny Mew. Okay, and what's that gonna do? Get exactly. me a shiny Mew. It's Shut. The- shiny Mew. Exactly. It's garbage. It's garbage. <laughs> it I is mean, not it, garbage. Again, it's like again, we're technology. People just want the shiny. It does. All you had to do is pay eight dollars. Give me a shiny Mew if you if you just happened to go to Venezuela and went to this one AR <coughs> part and here and this that or just something random or special, something that makes it rare. Not hey, I paid eight bucks for it. That is the reason why technology is killing gaming. It's making it to where you're rewarding bad behavior. You're just rewarding bad behavior. Eight yes. bucks. Like I had this the other day. A, a friend of mine invited me to. Uh, uh, a legendary raid, and it was two of us. And ten seconds left, I'm like, okay, five seconds, I'm jumping out. And five seconds, I jumped out. That friend chastised me, like, how dare you jump out? How dare you jump out? I'm like, I'm not wasting money on this. This is stupid. This is stupid. Oh, it's just 99 cents. 99 cents? <laughs> five times this, five bucks. Compounded. That's a yeah. game. That's a damn game. Five dollars is two D and D minis. And and look at some of these indie games that are that are out there. There are a lot of indie games with lower graphics that have better stories. And if people saw them out there and if they made it to mainstream would be so much more popular. But they don't get it because first they're indie, second they don't go for the, the right graphics. But a lot of these people have better stuff than what is being put out in mainstream. But again, this is this is a statistic from 2019. There are more than 2.7 billion gamers out there. Gamers out there. The the market for gaming is 159.3 billion dollars. And 85% of the industry's revenue comes to free to games, free to play games. As of February 2020, uh, I'll, I'll post the statistics in the description. I'll put the link to the website. The freemium games are, you, developers have to jump on the freemium game, which makes the freemium games ridiculous. And it's, it's ruining gaming. It's ruining gaming. Technology's ruined it. Cell phones, smartphones have ruined gaming. Because now, when someone says, oh, I'm a gamer, everyone's like, oh, it's evolved, it's evolved. <laughs> hasn't evolved, it's de-evolved. People go, oh, I'm a gamer. I'm like, oh, cool, what console do you play? Well, I don't play consoles. Okay, what's your PC rig? What, what, tell me about your PC rig. Well, I don't do PC rig. Well, how the fuck are you a gamer? Go, Board games, tabletop, hey, talk to me, what do you got? Oh, I don't do that either. What the fuck are you doing? Oh, I'm playing mobile games. Seriously? That's how you can see it. You think you're a gamer because you play a mobile game. Your mobile game is garbage. I do not understand how these people think, and I do not like an industry that, that rewards these bad things because mobile gaming is destroying it because it's taking away what I want, the... The expiration, the, the the fun of learning something new, the the fact that I'm able to have a great art storyline. I get to play as the main antagonist. Some games I play as the main protagonist. I, I miss out on the, like you said, the tearjerker moments. Or I miss out on games where flight simulators 
I'm missing out on all that because they think this size screen makes them a gamer. No, it doesn't. It, 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 tabletop. Oh, we have a TV as our D&D board. Okay, cool. Like, what figurines do you use? Oh, we don't use figurines. We have a table. We have a TV. Uh, that's not D&D, man. That's... Okay. And then I know people who argue that figurines aren't D&D. Bullshit. Back in the 90s when there was no figurines because no company was making them except the pewter ones and pewter breaks. Pewter breaks really easily. <laughs> So and bends. Uh, how many times do you get that stupid sword and it's <laughs> all the way over, the, and you try to bend it back and and, and it's never quite right and yeah. So you're all like, I am the destroy. I am the Hoffman the destroyer. I have conquered many of realm. Here I am. I've slain the magical beast with my bent sword. <laughs> it's it's. The reason why I didn't use pewter also is because you couldn't paint pewter. Painting pewter was hard to prime it and to paint it. And moving past all that, that's the reason why figurines weren't a big deal in the 90s. I think a lot of people who learned tabletop didn't have it because they didn't have the pewter available to them. Now, with the plastic and with, with all the different printing options, figurines are there. And so, go ahead. Sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off, but I will say that is one of the positives of technology is the plethora of uh, miniatures and the introductions of my favorite is Hero Forge. We've done videos on it. If you haven't seen it yet, check out the video about when uh, Hero Forge first came out with. That's colored... a subtle hint to put the Hero Forge video on the <laughs> end of this one for everyone who doesn't know De Hoffren's <laughs> subtle subtleties. Subtleties. Uh, but one of my friends, he used to be against minis, not because he didn't like them, but there weren't enough options. And he's like, all right, somebody is playing an archer, but all we can find to use for his character is somebody holding a sword. He sees his figure with a sword, and he thinks that he has the sword to fight with. And he's like, no, you don't. That's not in your inventory. And that was his main objective objection to using miniatures was there wasn't enough options for him to use to make the character what they wanted and hold what they wanted. Now, even without Hero Forge, even without all these wonderful options of designing your own, I can go down to my local game shop and I can find a male teethling wizard. I can find a male uh, Asimar paladin with my weapon of choice and be able to use that and actually make what I have envisioned a reality on the board. But again, it's going back to my topic of how gaming is destroying, how technology is destroying that gaming is there are some, there are some lot of benefits. There's a lot of benefits, which we can go into another topic of how technology is furthering gaming. But I think we need to focus as a community of, Standing up and saying, stop developing shit. Stop developing shit. Like, I really truly think that a game developer needs to put out a game like an old school RPG and say, hey, this game is $80. Let's say it's $80. Everything you need to do in the game is in the game. You won't need a DLC. You won't need anything. Here you go. And, you know, there's going to be hackers who are going to try to cut into that and stuff like that. But I think gaming people, people who will stick with you forever that don't jump over to the fucking free-to-play games, kills me 85% of the industry is that. I Pay think to that win. We will, we will rise up and say, nope, I'm sick. I'll buy that $8 game. I've had many friends who've stopped playing games because they've spent years, months, time in the game, getting the gear, the top gear, and working for it, and then all of a sudden, they start doing uh, pay-to-get-what-you-want stuff, and all of a sudden, this kid that's been playing for three days bought a, a, a weapon set, and all of a sudden, they're out gunning, they're out fighting somebody who's put in the time, and it's like, what what is the effort in me playing this game 
building my character if you're just going to give somebody else something that's going to kill me in one shot kind of like an eight dollar ticket so you get a shiny mew (laughs) in in a a collector standpoint it's, it's lost its appeal whenever i can pay for something when i can pay for a suit of armor when i can pay for a shiny item when i can pay for it instead of earning it it loses the lackluster and technology for the industry to stay afloat is rewarding bad behavior. We are rewarding bad behavior. We're industry people that should be no longer there should no longer be there. Churn out good games. You know, I wouldn't, I would love it if we were in a society to where they said, Hey, you 10 percenters, here's your 10% games. I, I wish there was a category in steam at GameStop, wherever there's a sliver 10% right here. If you're not that 10%, don't don't buy the damn game. You know you won't buy it. Just go somewhere else. And I want a complete game, damn it. I, I want a complete game. I want a game like Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is a board game. Set a standard of meticulous board games. Digitally, they suck. Early access, they suck. Make, a, make the digital version... Focus on one or the other. Don't make both. Sorry. Technology. Let's start with one. Bad. Technology bad. Tablets. Technology bad. I hate tablets. I hate tablets. I hate cell phones. Tablets go away. I hate tablets. Surface Pro is the only thing you should have. Get rid of the iPad. That's all. Yep. My See? IPad. Boo. Boo. Ruining everything. Because he's, he's a culprit, everybody. He's a culprit. Him and his husband I have. neglect their PCs, neglect their their consoles. Don't you dare say it. I'll pull up your, uh, your Switch statistics. You've now gone to the offline stage. Not how many days the, the Nintendo's given up on you. Shut your mouth, sit back, and go, I'm a bad person. I I am a recovering person. You are what a premium. I, what am I using... To talk to you right now, you my tablet, P- my phone, or my PC. Your PC. I'm using my PC. What do I use every time that we game? Your PC. My tablet, my PC. Okay. I'm using my PC. What do I play Magic Legends online with? My PC. What do you play other games with? There we go. That's it. See, I love, I love how, I love, I, 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 I there's a scene from one of the greatest movies of all time. Remember the Titans. I hate this, I hate the fact that it's a football movie. It's such a good movie, but ruined with football. <laughs> ruined with sports. You okay. hate that movie because you have to watch that clip every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a there's a scene in there that 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 everyone always skims over that has changed me <laughs> has been is prolific to me. It's changed my life. It's right after the main coach was just uh, the brick was thrown through the window of the of the of the secondary coach, and the secondary coach comes up and says, "You know, if you didn't cause a problem, people wouldn't do this." And he says to him, "I don't dance if I don't hear music. I don't scratch my head if it doesn't itch." Every time I tell someone I say this, like I made the things about you, you're like, "Well, what do I do with this? What do I do?" I'm like, "That's fine. Those are two, three things." Now the other plethora of stuff you do. 